the, the question is, it, if we live in a universe of life and creativity that is constantly creating new and higher ordered states of existence from lower ordered states by its own nature, it's not like human beings are engineering this. It's the universe seems to be doing it itself. And the fact that human beings emerged out of that process with these attributes that we can willfully, potentially, um, tap into that source when we're being a mature self like that we were destined to be and configure our laws that we create for ourselves in conformity with a higher idea of what that natural law is as a creative law of self-perfectibility. Well, that means that abundance is implicit in the universe, that there is a demand that we constantly, it's not a, it's not a mistake that we're 8 billion or 9 billion or 20 billion people. That's not a mistake. That's the, that's the effect of us having done the right thing at times when we needed to by making discoveries and translating them in the material domain. Well, this, this is a, a slow, um, th this was a part of the night sky taken by the original Hubble telescope that has been replaced by the James Webb, another beautiful telescope that's producing some incredible results of deep space. There had been the presumption that there was a ultra black section of the celestial sphere that was believed to have no stars or galaxies within it. And what they did is they did a, a long focus on that particular little black spot with the, the Hubble telescope over the course of I don't know how long. And what they what was returned back was this incredible dense array of galaxies and 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 not like so you see some stars from within our galaxy here, but you also see a lot of galaxies that are outside of our own Milky Way. Um, a lot containing beautiful structures, structure that reflects the golden sections, the golden section being something that we have to hold in mind is something that doesn't tend to occur in non-living forms of matter, matter. The golden section expresses itself most clearly and almost, almost uniquely in living material processes. This, the this is the Fibonacci series. The, the Fibonacci series is sort of the mathematical, uh, logarithm zeroing in on the golden section proportion uh, as the divine proportion but it's like you could you could get at it more as like a rectangle with one side being um like let's say square square root of five over one to the other side of the longer part of the rectangle being like let's say one and you have a proportion um you get at it when you're looking at the pentagon and you're constructing the pentagon inside of a, a circle for example um the five-sided uh division that five-sided polygon and there's a certain relationship of the like when you when you have the star inside the pentagon connected you have the short side to the long side is like a is to b as b is to a plus b and that specific relationship is self-reflective so it can constantly you can always plant in pentagons within pentagons or you can always grow in a self-similar way a spiral if you grow it outside of itself with those rectangles um a set of proportions that will have these these perfect self-reflective characteristics. And we find that aesthetically speaking, the ancient Greeks were, were much more sensitive to the, in, the coherence between the internal structure of a healthy soul to the external uh, sacredness of the beauty of the, of the external objective world. And that's why the many Greek buildings are built to scale to the, the golden section. We see it also in certain it's Renaissance intuitive. buildings. It's, 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 sort of, yeah, it's, it's like that it's, harmony. It's that kind of yeah, it's like a visual harmony. It's a, it's a, it's a, you have visual space and audible space. The, the two spaces are something which we find ironies in and in the visual space, there's certain symmetries and harmonies visually they're, they're, they're without sound. And then you have the, the, the audible spaces too, which again, we intuitively could find we they've dug up flutes from, uh, um, I think the Balkans was where they, they dug up this flute from 30,000 years ago was when it was dated. And the positioning of the holes within the flute are uh, positioned very close to the, the well-tempering scale. So it was implied that it was like well-tempered in such a way that this is something which people have been told only came about in the Renaissance um, with Johann Sebastian Bach. But if this implies that these types of proportions 
were already there before people could really think logically about it. It was just something that they it reson the soul resonated to uh, in the audible space domain, you know. So we have, uh, and there's Tibetan bells also that are positioned in such a way that it's like equal tempered. Again, very, very similar things that didn't have logic defining it. It was just like the, 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 the inner soul of the people of humanity resonates to the universe in such a way that we intuitively chart out certain paths of beauty. And we find the fact that we find later on as science evolved that it also is scientifically viable, like that it's the, that the only pathways towards science, which is why Da Vinci was doing so much work on the golden section. And he was making revolutionary breakthroughs in every field of science that he touched in engineering and architecture and robot, you know, everything um, also reflects that. So the fact that we see this in the, in the so-called dead universe, right? It's not like there's human beings or, or plant life floating in space, however, not necessarily, but what we see by looking at the evidence of the golden section animating the, the geometries of galaxies implies that the universe might not be this cold, dead, process of a machine that's slowly going into a heat death and you know we're, we're given these models right we had a big bang 13.7 billion years ago when everything was contained in like this infinitely dense singularity before which nothing existed so how first of all how does everything come from nothing that's already a big intellectual like what uh but we have to assume that everything just started there and thus, they will extrapolate kind of like what they've done for uh, the like the Malthusian uh, programs or the global warming trends or the uh, the eugenics models that, you know, if we don't sterilize your your family fast, then based upon the evidence, the data of your parents and great grandparents having like low IQs, you're you're going to contaminate the human gene pool with your great grandkids having low IQs. So we should sterilize you preventatively now to stop well, if that. We're going to go to IQs. I think uh, the current uh, monarch of the, you know, uh, <laughs> over in England, yeah. uh, probably needs to be measured. I, I think we could go off on an amazing tangent here, and I'd, I'd just like to pull it back a little bit, which is that yeah. our original kind of title for today was, you know, Solutions for Avoiding a Dark Age. Yes. Um, and I think that if we, again, look at this conflict between closed system thinking and open system thinking, and particularly bringing it back into what's happening, obviously globally, but uh, most of the audience will be Irish, is this, again, the reflection between the Great Famine, the Great Reset, the World Economic Forum, where are we going? And what can, you know, where, where are we heading if we don't do anything? But it, it, okay. even as I'm asking that question, I feel like the wheels are off their plans just at some incredibly rapid rate, but they don't seem to be able to adjust their course. They seem to be going over that cliff, regardless of, of whether, you know, they, they achieve their goals or not, they're going to, they're going to just keep going. What, what's your Absolutely. kind of take Absolutely. On that? And, and that's why I, I just wanted to really just have that, that image there of the, the universe, just because the, the question is, it, if we live in a universe of life and creativity, that is constantly creating new and higher ordered states of existence from lower ordered states by its own nature, it's not like human beings are engineering this, it's the universe seems to be doing it itself. And the fact that human beings emerged out of that process with these attributes that we can willfully, potentially um, tap into that source when we're being a mature self like that we were destined to be and configure our laws that we create for ourselves in conformity with a higher idea of what that natural law is as a creative law of self-perfectibility. Well, that means that abundance is implicit in the universe, that there is a demand that we constantly it's not, a, it's not a mistake that we're 8 billion or 9 billion or 20 billion people. That's not a mistake. That's the, that's the effect of us having done the right thing at times when we needed to by making discoveries and translating them in the material domain. Because that's the mind matter problem, right? That the, 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 the discovery happens in a metaphysical domain, right? In the, in the domain of ideas, but then the idea that is trans material can influence and even cause the shaping of the material domain by virtue of these new, these new technologies when we have a moral um, mandate, of, right, a society that is governed not by a rule of an oligarchical hereditary elite that sees a threat in such things. So today what we have is a structure, a situation, I guess you could say, whereby again, the, the open versus closed system idea, which gets at your, your point, for people to really get this, they need to wrap their minds, like, because like, why is there a reasonable foundation for hope today? Good, like not just irrational hope, but solid hope. The 
it requires an appreciation for certain characteristics. It's, it's, it's not enough to simply say open versus zero sum. I could say the multipolar alliance of Russia and India and China and many African nations that don't want to sacrifice themselves in Iran uh, are multipolar and open system. I could say that, but it doesn't mean much. And I could say that the unipolar system is, is closed. It's a, it's a closed system of adapting to scarcity and creating scarcity and getting us to adapt to greater degrees of less. Um, I could say that, but it doesn't mean much. Um, so if you look at just some of the basic characteristics of an open system, open systems, just like we we're talking with the NLP, it's non-zero sum. You're, you're, you're reframing and finding some, if you're in a state of depression and you can't get out of it, that's a zero sum. Like the present has no solution. I got to create a solution in the future that is not existent in my present. That, that applies for the individual as much as it applies for humanity. So... <clears throat> It is non-zero sum. There's always more energy that can be introduced because time is now also a function of the process. It's, it's not just the now. Um, the whole is more in an open system. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. So just like us as individuals, we know that I am not my arms, the sum total of my limbs. I'm not the sum total of my cells. There's something more because every cell, most of my cells have turned over completely since I was seven years old. There's very little cells in my bones or in my body that are the same. And every moment there's like several million cells that are that die and 7 million that are born in each one of my organs that each are very diverse in their function. Oh, we're but amazing, aren't we? Aren't we just incredible? You know, 86 billion give or take neurons in the brain. Each one can make connections with 10,000 other ones. Oh you know, we use a fraction of our, of our power. Yeah, it's inspiring. And despite that, I'm like the same kid, you know, when I was a seven year old looking in the mirror saying I'm Matthew, there are still some characteristics that are very much the same identity, which is more than the sum of the parts that is Matthew looking back, you know, and I, the way I felt when somebody would tell a lie or, or uh, willfully, I, I still have that same sort of feeling in my soul. So the soul, the, the identity, these, these go on, they're more than the sum of the parts. It's like that for everything, you know, dead rabbit, living rabbit might be the same weight almost or whatever, you know, same material compounds. But the, rat, the dead rabbit is definitely not animated by something that the, light, the living rabbit is. So that life process is, again, it's, it's, a, it's a metaphysical, but existent, it's, a, it's an efficiently existent uh, reality that shapes existence, right? So relative limits to growth, okay? Open systems, there's always limits to what we, how much we can grow. Today, there's abs there are limits to what we can do based on certain things we talked about today. But those are relative because if we new, make a new discovery, well, we can increase those uh, limits growth potential. And if we forget things, if we have discoveries that we once knew that are crushed, let's say we, we get rid of the knowledge of atomic power and we just crush it, we sabotage it. Well, we can create new constrained limits. We can make limits even worse. So it's, it, we've got this like potential sphere which can press on us or, or move beyond to have more space to, to move into based on, again, this factor of discoveries of the universe or not making discoveries. Politically speaking, when you apply it, um, open systems, and this goes back into ancient studies of ancient history. Uh, I could look at the periods of the Silk Road Dynasty originally, the Han Dynasty of, uh, of, the, of, of China um, for 400 years. There was a sort of a win-win. You're, you're not looking at your neighboring nations or neighboring cultures as being necessarily your opponents or enemies to fight for, for diminishing returns. You are generally looking for what are common uh, benefits to us coexisting together, sharing. That's the Silk Road idea originally, and, and that's what and, it... And, and here it would have been, you know, the Brehan Laws, you know, was was very much, you know, you cause no loss. So so the Brehan, B-R-E-H-O-N, so that would be the ancient uh, Celtic laws, I'm sure. Uh, the my making sense, uh, admin will put something in the chat if I've got this wrong. Um, but they're basically moral laws to live by that are actually you know totally about being human so you know you cause no loss uh injury uh or harm and I if you live like by ancient... those if you live by those rules then it is about living in harmony and cooperation these, these are like ancient you, 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 you live with your own you take personal responsibility and if you do cause some harm then you are responsible for that and you you willingly take that on yeah, that's solid. You don't need a, an external force to tell you what's good or what's right or what's wrong. It's the island's indigenous system of laws that date from the Iron Age. And how far back does this go? This is like pre-Christian? -Christ, pre so the, from the Iron Age is... is 
wow, I love that. And I, I had read a book called How the Irish Saved Civilization by Thomas Cahill uh, some years back. And I think when he, because he was talking about St. Patrick and what St. Patrick did to preserve Augustinian Christianity, uh, which had been annihilated on the mainland uh, as the Roman Empire collapsed and went into you know its own dark age. Um, he goes through how St. Patrick found a lot of similarity in the pre-existing uh, ethical philosophy of a lot of these, these Irish. Um, they were pagan, but at the same time, they had a very strong ethical foundation. And he was like, I can work with that. That's a lot to, and he was able to sort of weave stories together that involved Christian Christian elements, but with already existing um, moral attributes. So I, this is a very important part of that story that I didn't really look at before. That's fascinating, and I love it. Interesting. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm gobsmacked. I was able to tell you something you didn't know. That was amazing. <laughs> when I listened to you, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go and have a lie down because I think my brain is going to, you know, kind of, uh, I'm going to have steam coming out my ears. Um, it's just just incredible. But sorry, so just to you know, if we could get, as you were saying right from the beginning, the Irish have such a history of, they had to work really hard to crush the Irish spirit. You know, and if you look back to that far, they, they had these laws that far back that meant that actually people were living in harmony on this island. You know, yeah. I don't know if you know much about epi epigenetics. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know a huge amount, but for me, it's like there's two sort of streams running. One is, is those ancient uh you know ancestors here who had that spirit in them and that sense of fairness and you know cooperation and living in in harmony with nature and with each other and then you have what was imposed and I think a lot of um the reason why it was so easy I think for so many for them to control so many people here we did have a very high uptake of all of the measures you know very you know strict adherence to to the social distancing to the mask wearing to the you know the injection uh we you don't want to make this uh, video completely uh <laughs> taken down just with that one word um, yeah. but i feel like it was just it was that they're carrying with them that sort of having been crushed and i just would love to see the the revival really of the the ancient celtic spirit uh coming to the and and rising up because even though I'm no, I, I wasn't born here I feel my uh, it's my spiritual home yeah well I, I think you're right and I mean epigenetics uh is, is very important I, I think that the 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 political expediency for the Darwinian philosophy or Darwinian theology I would say almost to be the dominant tool that we're allowed to use and the only tool we're allowed to use if we're expected to be respected in uh, academia regarding our opinions on bio biology or evolution it's, it's purely to destroy the, the much more organic and truthful, I believe, understanding of um, the evolution of cultures, as well as of, of whole systems of species, which occur in a much more harmonic way with a direct continuity um, to processes that happened. Like there, there's a continuity, there, and, but that continuity is, is also tied to creative leaps. So it's not like you have in the Darwinian system, it's a continuous function of just gradualism. And that's what we were told in the 1850s, 60s is like the only competent approach to science of life. Um, it's a struggle for survival in a world of diminishing returns, creating a tension among species. And that tension, it's a very Hobbesian world, right? It's a closed system world of Darwin. And that tension of absence of scarcity induces an increased claw, you know, and, and, and every species within us, we're, suppo we're supposed to believe has these randomized mutation functions like the infinite throwing of dice all the time, all at all places. And sometimes we get lucky and that dice rolls in just the way that allows for a bigger claw to kill off the, the opponent, opponent species that you're vying for, you know, you wanna have more sex, you wanna eat more food in a world of scarcity. Well, you can, do it, you can now do it with that bigger claw and the weak will be weeded out, they will be destroyed and the fit will, will then thrive. Now in the Darwinian system, if you look at it, this is obviously politically motivated because if you can have this become the dominant belief in science, then the British Empire can justify its existence when people say, well, maybe this is immoral, what we're doing to Ireland or India or Africa. It's maybe evolution. We, it's evolution. It's like they're in nature. What, you're going to fight nature? Just let it be, you know? Um, and, and on top of that, Darwin even says in his autobiography that he got his 
the system upon which to work by reading Thomas Malthus's essay on population. And he describes it in his own words and people. Oh, wow. Yeah. He said, but I was only when I was on the Beagle that I picked up for entertainment essay, uh, Darwin's uh, 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 Malthus's, yeah, essays. And by then appreciating the, the battle uh, for survival in a world of diminishing returns, I thereupon had a, had a theory by which to work. And of course, Thomas Huxley, managed who handled um the this again a bit of a, a sad pathetic cardboard cutout um named Charles Darwin I don't think Darwin himself was aware of the political motives behind it but Thomas Huxley certainly was and Huxley fought like tooth and nail to get Darwin accepted but T Thomas Huxley also admits in his own private letters that he never believed in Darwin so it's like hmm that's interesting right there and then I never knew that that's that is know? really <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and this ties it back to the Great Reset then, right? Because then, well, what was it that that happened next? Well, once that was established, and again, things like Nature Magazine came out of Thomas Huxley's X Club for the singular purpose of promoting um, Darwinianism um, as a propaganda tool in 1865. And, and so immediately thereafter, you have the social, the more directed social application of Darwin's theology in the form of um, Darwin's cousin, Thomas uh, Francis Galton, who develops this the science of eugenics using some Mendelian uh, genetic theories uh, mixed in with Darwinianism, but applied to human social organization to weed out the human gene pool of the unfit and retool the uh, the species into the blank slates that would be in conformity with uh, an a class of uber mention. He was a very Nietzschean philosophies, right? The, the, that the the elites are destined to be the elites because simply they are born into the elite family. And if they were not born into such an elite family, then some other family that would be more elite in alpha would be would be dominating them as slaves, and they would be the slaves. And that's sufficient evidence that they need scientifically to justify their their right. As Yuval Harari says, you know, we thought that there was, uh, for years, centuries, people were animated by the false delusion that there was intelligent design, but we now know it's all chaos and randomness. It's until now. And he says, but the intelligent designers of the of the future are the CEOs of Davos and of Google and of Facebook. And you could hear this idiot saying these things, implying what view of an elitist you know, idea of humankind is Uber mentioned, who will manage the levers of evolution going forward into the test tube CRISPR baby uh, reality, right? Now, they, I don't think they have the power to do it, but it, it gives you direct continuity from Malthus, who was, again, a British East India Company economist who um, then had his ideas repackaged in Darwinism, which is all just Hobbesianism. It's just Thomas Hobbes saying, you know, we need a Leviathan because human beings are just naturally selfish and they can't rule themselves. So we need a Leviathan from the top to manage these, these beasts in the human zoo. That's just Hobbes. So Hobbes was Malthus, you know, and then, and then it became Darwin. Darwin then they, says they literally Dolphin, have so little creativity that they just have to keep taking one idea and just yeah regurgitating yeah, they, it and well, just they're, they're you know, tweaking, tweaking it and they're adaptive they're not creative they can only react to to try to stop creative discoveries that actual humans make and then they're forced to like you know go through the trouble of figuring out how they that's the type of like limited creativity from an oligarchy is trying to figure out how do you subvert the consequences of actual creative discoveries and, and or how do you just block them from happening if possible, ideally? Uh, so that's like not really creativity. That's a weird perversion of creativity. Or then like, how do you maybe uh, narrowly uh, steer the creative people into uh, jobs where they're working in advertising and entertainment and video games, you know, and everybody and, and else. Actually, and, and, and someone pointed out to me uh, that Twitter yeah. is, is great for creative people in terms of uh, zapping, sapping, sorry their creativity because you have to be quite creative in such a you know uh short number of words and then you feel like you've you've kind of expended your creativity for the day then you go off and do something that's completely meaningless so it's kind of quite clever in terms of actually hoovering up the creativity that's a good point yeah and also like I, I, it's not mine someone told me but I went yeah and then I noticed and then I was like it's kind of weird because you kind of feel like you're quite flattered on on you know someone's going to come back at you with twist so but where does it go it doesn't go anywhere yeah, it's a very self-contained little bubble of creativity, right? Like, we're, yeah. yeah, exactly. Addictive, it's like addictive, because you're like, oh, here's my outlet for create for creative writing oh, and having a creative, creative argument. Oh, that's good, Sarah. That's good. It, yeah. So I'm going to use that 
to going forward into the future. I like that. Um, the other and the other thing too is that there was a false debate that people should just appreciate because it's very important since the false debate around the time of Galton was around uh, Herbert Spencer. So social Darwinism was actually a term created by Herbert Spencer, who was uh, a friend of Thomas Huxley, and he would uh, come around Huxley's X Club. Now, Herbert Spencer said he's the opponent of Galton. Galton, by the way, won over Darwin. Darwin said, you have won a new acolyte and a disciple to you. To you. I, I had my doubts, but now I realize you are the man and, and I worship you. So that's my words. He, but I, you've won a disciple, he did say. But now, so Galton, his cousin, comes up with like the idea of eugenics as a social policy for the, the Fabian society, you know, controllers of the, the human engineered system. Whereas Herbert Spencer says, no, if you just let it all be, have absolute free market, let everybody hedonistically just be what they will and, and, and try to maximize pleasure and avoid pain, that ultra liberalism will thus cause the stronger to weed out naturally the weaker. The weaker, weaker will naturally be destroyed in a more natural way. The, the stronger will just win out. And, you know, that will be, and he was basically following the edicts of Adam Smith. Again, Adam Smith working for. Shelburne, who was the head of the British uh, Foreign Office. Just, and, it's just one big club. One big club. It, it's, it's not a big club. Well, uh, yeah, but it's not but, a big but club, it's, but it's, it's, you know. It's prevalent. All, yeah, you find, as they say, all roads lead to Rome. All, exactly. And Britain wanted to be the, uh, the new Roman Empire and do it right. Um, that was their ambition. That still is the ambition today, to fulfill the dream and ambitions of the, the Roman Empire before it collapsed but do it right, you know, without the problem of this pesky Christianity that, that got in the mix and, and, and made things difficult, um, which is why they also commissioned Sir Edward Gibbon to write The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, published in 1776, the same date that Adam Smith publishes his Wealth of Nations. That was a historical study of the Roman Empire, where Gibbon gets across that, and again, he's working for the British Empire, as a, his, as a study to see, okay, well, he says that it was Christian, everything was great about the Roman Empire the cults, the cult creation, everything was fantastic. It was really just the Christianity that, that broke the equation. So if we could do it again, but just undermine and destroy that, that quality within Christianity that made it a problem then, then we can do it right and, and never be challenged. End of history, right? Unipolar world, world order, finally. So um, back to Spencer. Spencer says, okay, we'll just let it all be. So Spencer becomes somebody who today is very much embraced by the anarchist and libertarians. So that's a movement that was really brought into play around the Austrian school of uh, Karl Menger, who is the leading um, retainer of uh, the head of the, ha the Habsburg Empire. Um, really what he was just doing was trying to destroy the American system of, of Frederick List, the national system of economics that had been spreading in the wake of Lincoln's success around Europe of the idea that nation states have a role to use protective tariffs to have national banks to direct state credit for internal improvements and work with your neighbors for big projects in a way that would uplift people out of squalor. That idea, which again, Frederick List was the key figure in, in Germany and, and more broadly in Europe and, and Russia and, and in Asia, who was becoming very prevalent, the Habsburgs had to counteract his influence. And that's where they, they, they repackaged Adam Smith's liberal philosophy of monetarism in the form of what became known as the Austrian school. People like Ludwig von Mises, these other nobles, uh, uh, von Hayek, other, other like Frederick von Hayek all became um, enforcers of this new doctrine, which was very much based in the Herbert Spencer uh, radical Darwinian idea of just let it all be, no nation states are needed for anything, uh, just the, the weak will, will be weeded out, the strong will per persevere. And the fact that, you know, today there's a, a certain problem where a lot of the people who are the most uh, inclined to detest the tyranny of things like the Great Reset Agenda and the, the deep state, which has taken control of many of their governments using the functions of government as tools of tyranny and enslavement. Obviously, that's happening. Mm -hmm. But they, because of their Austrian school, um, Spencer, anarchist, anarcho philosophy, and, and it's, it's really an ideology, they, they perceive when they look at that evidence, they see it as evidence that that is what happens when you let nation states just exist. 
when you let nation states influence economic affairs in general, that is what they do. And so if we could just destroy the nation state system, which is intrinsically feudalistic, then we'll have liberty. And we'll so all you have free. two factions who are ultimately looking at doing the same thing, but for different reasons. And then, so who, what, who are you left with then? It's all about the effect. The effect in both cases is the same. Um, what you're left with, and, and th this is where um, I did want to show this, because when you get at the question of, well, like, well, what was it that Frederick List was bringing online, that Abraham Lincoln brought online, that came out of the American Revolution, that even like the better Sinn Féin members uh, had been brought bringing online by bringing in the 1890s or the IRA in the 1890s and uh, and early all the way into the 20s, they were bringing. Lincoln's economic policies of protectionism, state credit, the free Irish movement was, was, was doing this in a big time. Um, this idea of national economics was premised around certain concepts that what gives value to your economy, what gives value to whatever you call money in your system is the power of, of human minds. Human minds are the source of the value. It's not the desire of the markets. It's not the desire to make money or to buy low, sell dear, none of that. Those things can happen as mechanisms. But what gives value to anything is the, the, the sacredness of the people and of the minds of the people that, that make the process work. That's what it's for. So um, when you, again, like one system is, um, if, if you wanna look today, okay, well, what is the biggest threat to the, the Great Reset that I can identify today? It is, the, it is behind what has been going on now for well over 15 years. This has been accelerating with, uh, Dick Cheney and, and, and Bush originally with the expansion of NATO with a missile shield in Russia's perimeter in the southern underbelly of Russia around the uh, Romania, Poland, Czech Republic, it, you know, every nation absorbed by Soros's operations into NATO because Soros put billions into reconfiguring former Soviet economies into becoming absorbed by the IMF, the World Trade Organization, and especially NATO militarily to host a missile shield that could then target Russia and destroy their ability to respond to an attack they, did this, they were doing the same thing to China. Um, and today you have 100,000 troops that have been built up around China's perimeter. You have a missile shield in South Korea. You have bio, biological warfare laboratories that have been doing work openly for 23 years on the ethnic gene stocks of Han Chinese, of Slavs specifically. And this was all laid out in the, the project, the neoconservative project for new American century, reorganizing American defenses from October, no, September uh, of the year 2000. They put it online. They basically said, biological terror using ethnically targeted pathogens that we can manufacture in laboratories is moving from the realm of terrorism to becoming a politically useful tool. That is almost, I've read that so many times, that is without maybe, I maybe screwed up one or two words. That is what they say. And this Paul Wolfowitz, uh, the Kagans, uh, like that's Victoria Newland's husband, um, like the whole configuration of these, these nasty creatures who are there currently right now managing the worst elements of both parties. They, they said that this is what the Chinese leadership and the Russian leadership have been looking at for 20 years with biological laboratories in Ukraine, in Georgia, in South Korea. There's over 324 US Pentagon directed bio, bio labs built up again out of 9-11 and, and the anthrax attacks another inside job with a missile shield. So you have all of this happening. Why? It's because if you look at the elements that what made the potency of the American Revolution and specifically the type of economic policy that I've been going through with Frederick List, Lincoln, the Hamiltonian economic policy that allows for national credit, protective, protective tariffs, banking, and a, a foreign policy of cooperation around projects of win-win of a win-win nature. This has been only expressed out far outside of the transatlantic zone of NATO and Five Eyes. It's, it's there in Russia, India, China, increasingly Pakistan, that you see projects that, for example, here's one element of the Belt and Road Initiative, the, the idea of extending not just rail, but also industrial corridors funded by state banks, that China is one of the only countries to keep control of their state, state banking institutions after they kicked out Soros. They, they aborted the project to privatize their banks, and that was, Soros was kicked out of China in 1989. Um, and they've been fighting their own deep state that had been put there really since, I mean, the Cold War. And David Rockefeller went along with Kissinger in installing a structure of Western obedient um, zombies into positions of influence within uh, China 
in order for China to get in exchange for them to get the type of industries that they needed, the factories to get out of the poverty and self mutilation they did to themselves under the Cultural Revolution. But so that that deep state structure, some of it has been weeded out, some of it is still there. But the point is, they've done a better job at fighting it and doing battle, whereas we've really failed and dropped the ball. So Russia, China, India have integrated their systems on a military level through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, on an economic level through building these types of rail. Much of this is high speed rail. Um, this is the called the India to Russia North South transportation. So, yep. So what about um, I don't know how it was. It was not that long ago. Was the Ecumen. Uh, meeting yeah uh, so this is the global financial forum and they you know when they laid out and it was opened by putin you know uh you know to the opening speech so it was 122 speakers from 22 countries and it was organized by the un um and it was always sponsored by them and it, it just seemed to like for people who go you know that this is not actually happen they're just it's like a game it's like a, a, they're, they're looking they're pretending to be multipolar but in reality they're actually operating exactly the same way as there, unipolar. yeah you that, know, that's so, what's very important to look at the difference we often use words and you'll find two people use similar words in a conversation or a debate and it's only sometime into the debate or the, the argument even that you realize the words we're using we have very different ideas of what those words mean and so you'll find that there is currently a major fight over some words, big words, like we are going to get a new order, for example, there will be a new system brought online there, the current system that we've been bailing out for like 15 years is destined to blow it was created to blow so there will be a new system. The question is whether the, op the operating structure, the operating, the operating system of that system is going to be founded upon a system where sovereign nation states will play a role defining the behavior of the economic uh, activities, the I, the definitions of wealth, uh, the definitions of words like. But is this only going to happen for those countries too? Is it going to be happening for those countries too? So, so is it is this so in terms of how the new system is brought online? Is it going to be two systems? Is there going to be is the world going to split into two, or is it going to be that one will eventually win over the you know? I don't think that these the 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 the. The nature and scope of the difference in the philosophy of these two operating systems, unipolar and multipolar, if you look at their activity, um, like their actions and what the what is animating them, it's so divergent that they have coexisted. Like open and closed systems have coexisted throughout ancient times. There has never been a time where only one has dominated. There's been or has won out completely. There have been times like in dark ages. Of which there have been several major ones where the closed system uh, operating structure became the dominant structure and it, it crushed all opposing philosophies into wars divide to conquer yada yada um at different times there were these moments of renaissance but it still didn't last it didn't last it didn't that, last you know, even though it was a long period it you know yeah it's still, it was not able to well keep human beings seem to be you know permanently yeah, we we it it took sometimes un, unnecessarily long amounts of time, and I don't think those dark dark ages were ever necessary. We could have made other decisions that would have uh, circumvented the consequences of those wrong ideas, but we had gone along in our corruption in the 14th century and and embraced that folly. And, and the consequences were the universe doesn't tolerate lies indefinitely, and the con and we we saw a civilizational collapse. The forgetting the forgetting of once living memories that we once had were gone. They had to be rebuilt with something new in the form of the Renaissance, which, again, it's a bit of a miracle that the Renaissance was even able to happen. But that was a fight by individuals who had a certain faith and a creative maturity that they were able to die. They're willing to die for. And if you don't have that identity, you, you can't make this stuff work. Um, so today we're at a situation where I think with nuclear, the nuclear technologies that we have today, for me, changes my 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 thinking a little bit because part of me says well you know they've closed and open systems have vied against each other for since ancient times immemorial maybe that will be the case for another few hundreds or thousands of years maybe okay but then i'm thinking to myself well we're also living in a world which has for the very first time access to an immense amount of power in the form of atomic energy and and atomic bombs thermonuclear thermonuclear weaponry things of that sort 
which kind of break the formula, <laughs> the formula of ancient history, because now we can undo ourselves. Um, so with that power comes great good. I mean, you can feasibly green deserts with by desalinating ocean water for cheap pittance. You know, you can you can green the deserts of the world and see them blossom. You could feed the world several times over. You know, you can avoid you could stop an asteroid for the first time every at every moment before the this this millennia or the century, I should say, the idea of ending an ast an asteroid that we was impossible. We couldn't even forecast that one was going to hit until relatively recently in human civilization. Not only can we identify if, if one is going to hit, but we can actually put into place systems with technologies and energy densities that can allow us to deflect or destroy such a thing were it to happen. Now, I mean, my God, what what type of wonderful ways to work together as a species legitimately does that offer? Does that mean that the oligarchy is not willing to or, or might wish to also scare us into working together for fake asteroid or something? Maybe they're willing to make something up and get us to be afraid to obey. A, you They'd know, never do anything like that. I don't know what you're implying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but I, but definitely, I mean, they've, they've created their fair share of, of fake uh, crises, but we have real crises that that do deserve us working together around, you know, the crisis of lack of food uh, wars, we can end these things we can end. I mean, we could deal with at least the consequences of the oncoming ice age in a way which is actually creative, we can do that. We honestly asteroids. Yeah, comets, we should be thinking seriously about cooperating on high tech and, and cooperation around those things. But the new system, what is it going to be? And, and what type of new monetary um, valuations will there be? In Russia currently, as you just pointed out, they've had conferences, as in China, which you see a battle. If you look at the presentations given by the Russian delegations who represent Russia, and then you, know, you're, you also have to be sensitive to the deep state, because there are deep state operatives still with power in Russia too. German Greff, or, uh, you know, who's a major player tied to the World Economic Forum, is still an influencer to this day. Um, so when you look at the, 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 the patriotic nationalists who clearly don't want to sacrifice their civilizations to this altar of post-truth, post-gender um, automata, they don't want to make their kids just these like blank slate automata to be programmed, that's clearly the case. They're, they're clearly trying to fight to have some sovereign control over their banking structure and economic destiny with their neighbors that they want to live in, in uh, peace with. You definitely have that with Russia's efforts diplomatically with India, with Pakistan, with China, with other Iran. And then you have this other thing that, that sees the world kind of like the inside out of that. The word sustainable, you will find can either be sustainable growth, meaning an actual sustained growth process, very different from the type of green zero growth, closed system sustainable terms we see from Klaus Schwab or others who say, we have to reduce our population and undo civilization to be sustainable with like other, other bugs and, and, and plant life is with nature. Sure. That's different. So like China, when they say sustainable, they're, they're desalinating water from the South. They're moving it with, with big water diversion projects and green big chunks of the Gobi Desert with the great South North water project. They're doing the same thing for you know, different areas of Africa even, who they're helping to build and train engineers. We don't do that. So the words themselves, new order, sustainable, um, an anarcho-capitalist or like an anarcho-libertarian type who doesn't believe that nation states should even exist. Like for example, uh, there's a fellow who's, I, I like him. I like, I like this fellow named Ian, Ian Davis. He's written a series of articles. Um, where he is showcasing his interpretation of why the multipolar order um, is a, just simply a controlled opposition for the Great Reset, and it's all part of the same game to enslave and destroy us. Ian, Ian Davis is also a self-described anarcho-libertarian. Uh, he believes that anarchism is the only way that should have ever been, and nation states should have never come into being, as he did in part one of his three-part new series on the multipolar order, as a fraud. Um, so if you believe that nation states are intrinsically bad, the way the libertarian, the von Hayek's and others have asserted, you will look at the world currently through that filter, that there's no, anytime you have central, central government, it is always bad. Thus, Franklin Roosevelt or Lincoln or JFK, who all used central government planning, 
aren't equally as bad as a Hitler or a, a Mussolini. It doesn't, it's, it's, it's all different flavors, the same totalitarianism, because it reduces your personal freedom to do whatever you want. And the maximum good in that philosophy is personal right to do whatever I want. Mm. Now that freedom is indeed truly sacred. I, I believe that. But when your population becomes manipulated to become, when, when folly becomes the new norm, people might want to, you know, let their kids become, you know, hormone therapy to become, uh, you know, transgender or something. Is that make it good? Because people want it. Should their personal desire, you know, I'm a depressed kid at the age of 16. I'm depressed and I can now have taxpayer euthanasia. I want that. Does my personal desire become what defines my, what my nation should do in respect? Not necessarily if you have this oligarchy influencing us. So it's, it's all sort of contingent on wisdom. So again, when I look at Russia, China, their overarching commitment, though they are, they're in war, they'll often be pleasant or polite to groups who are dishonest um, around the UN agenda, you know, Antony Guterres or, or Klaus Schwab, they'll be polite. But two people can be polite on the surface and yet want to destroy each other in their minds, <laughs> right? That's part of like, you know, nice it's diplomacy. It's politics, isn't it? It's politics. That's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> so again, I, I, that's why I'm saying like, when you actually just look at what these countries are doing, they're doing the things we've been told we're not allowed to do mm. for the past 50 years since they killed JFK. China has built up, this is all high-speed rail. It's 30,000 kilometers. They're going to double that. They have magnetic levitation uh, rail. Have they been doing I don't. That? I can't even get a train from here to Dublin. Yeah. I only live an hour's drive away. I mean, you know, it is really like when you look at that and you look at what's happened in Ireland in terms of the infrastructure and public transport is, you know, it, it's absolutely diabolical. I don't know what it's like in, in regions of Canada, wherever you are, um, you know, and you just and then this idea of they're going to have everyone driving an electric car, but we don't have enough power. We're going to have rolling blackouts. Yeah. And it's like it's this con. And, and I mean, I had I know somebody whose husband is very <laughs> she's watching this. She'll know who I'm talking about who's very smart, you know, very well educated. And he says, well, we, it's, if we have to go cold and hungry for the sake of the planet, then so be it. And you're thinking, no. but then yeah. I always think that anyone saying that has never been cold or hungry. Yeah, it's a, it's a very- it's a very short space of time between once you're in that to realize this isn't such a great idea. Exactly. You know, why would we want our children to be cold and hungry? For, yeah. for what? Like, who are we saving the planet for? Exactly. You know, yeah, exactly. No, that's a key point. And you're right. It's a very privileged, uh, fluffy thing to say. And if, if you live in the real world, it, it's, you will find very quickly how unviable <laughs> that opinion is, even though it's been put in a lot of people's heads. Um, or we have to starve and, and uh, freeze to death to, to save well, you. They're, they're, they're saying so many things like, you know, oh, yeah, the, the list goes being, on. <laughs> being hungry is, is a good thing. It's a good thing. And, and, and a little and a little nuclear war would be good for the planet. A little nuclear war would be would be good. Yeah, it might reverse some global warming. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah great. So yeah. All the stuff is coming into our, our field of propaganda and it's it's so insane. Um, but it's like if you look at. So, again, what are they what are these countries that we're being told we have to hate and fear, um, whether we're on the left or on the right or on the alt right or alt left, whatever we have to we're different forms of narratives have been given to us on a, you know, on a, on a silver platter to find reasons to hate and fear those countries that are actually doing existential battle currently and have been offering us and asking us to work with them. Like China and Russia have been working on overtime for years, trying to get us back to our senses to find some collaboration that they could work with in, in cooperation around building these sorts of things together. They have offered the West opportunities to convert the US treasuries that they're holding onto that are toxic waste. I mean. So the trillions of dollars of U.S. debt that China has is monopoly money. It's not going to be worth anything. And China has offered to convert that into development credits for building up not just infrastructure to rehabilitate and help our industrial base, which desperately needs it, but also to build infrastructure inside of North America and Europe, too. Like they want to work as partners. They don't want to go to war. They want us to get our biological uh, warfare operations out of South Korea and out of Ukraine and Georgia, as we should. We shouldn't have them there. Um, 
And so they've yeah, done it, all- but then but then you have the likes of was it in Boston University? They they decided to see if they could make a coronavirus even more, you know, COVID uh, virus even more lethal. And they were like, yeah, it's 80 percent lethal. It's like, yes, for genetically bred mice that have no vitamin D. Yeah, you know, it's but, you're going, it's, but let alone the point of like what they would do. Why were they doing it? You, you just yeah. have to go. What is the? Yeah, it's quite kind of. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so just to show a couple of images to make this real, because a lot of people it's too theoretical. So for to just to make it real, the Belt and Road Initiative that we were, we're told is the new global baddie out to try to enslave the world and undo Western Christian civilization. No. If you look at what it's doing with the, with Pakistan, there there are corridors that have been built up with high speed with high speed rail. Some, but they want to maximize that. A lot of rail, a lot of development. This is the reason why Imran Khan was ousted in a Western State Department coup d'état recently because he was a little bit too enthusiastic about uh, ending the effects of colonialism in Pakistan and working with both Russia and with China on a variety of things. He got uh, Pakistan. Did, did he just was there a ruling yesterday? Did I see that he was that was it? He was not allowed to run like he was. Yeah, he was, that's yeah it. it's a huge, huge deep state coup that has again yeah. been directed by the same forces that created Pakistan in 1946, aka British Empire Lord Mountbatten. Same guy who uh, that we, I, I know the Irish know how to. How to oh, it's all coming out it. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I saw that article that uh, yeah. Ronan sent. It's crazy. Yeah. So, this is the thing. This they created. Pakistan as a as an as a country back in 46 in order to create a situation of divide to conquer when they so-called left but always kept control of big chunks of Pakistani intelligence big chunks of the Indian intelligence to always create a situation of controlled chaos in that zone finally you have leadership that wants to get out of that through the help of uh China's investments and Russia's support and other things and so yeah he had to be ousted um same thing for I mean Afghanistan China has put forth massive development projects to integrate the new Silk Road projects through Afghanistan via Pakistan through the Khyber Pass and other places that would also go into Iran, um, as well as into Saudi Arabia. What was the Iranian ma uh, map that would involve uh, different high speed corridors going through Iran that are already being built connecting into Iraq as part of a reconstruction of the destruction that was done by the United States and their allies since 9-11 and before that even with Desert Storm. Sorry, do you not mean the liberators? The liberators, yeah, the, the freedom, liberators. Yeah, who brought freedom to these countries. Yeah, yeah the freedom to, to starve <laughs> and, and watch your kids die. Just so, destroy a, a, a country. I mean, that's that's where my father's from, is Iraq. Really? Yeah, wow. so I, I actually grew up in Baghdad in, in the uh, 70s. Wow, okay. Well, that's, the, yeah, see, right now, Iran and, and Iraq, Currently have the Shalamsha to Baghdad railway being built up as we uh, no Shalamsha to Basra uh, railway being built up um, on the borders. The first time we have a real rail connection mm -hmm. that could then connect easily into the already existing rail going into Syria. There's like 1,500 kilometers that would easily tie into that as part of again a broader reconstruction program, um, which isn't just building rail. It's when you build rail, you're building also new industrial corridors, new energy corridors. Like th it's this whole complex system. Um, of creation to bring in new virtues and, and capacities that were outside of the closed system. It, it, it infuses new types of creative insights that would not exist otherwise. That's all vital. And even like Saudi Arabia has increasingly recognized how disposable they and are. Are, they, are the they looking, they're looking to join BRICS Plus, I understand. So this yeah, is- Yeah, they've made their, their announcement clear. They, 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 they rightfully uh, shafted Joe Biden on several key points. They're, they're very much vectored towards a pro-Eurasian orientation at this point. And again, it's not because purely they're virtuous. It's not that at all. It's that they recognize on a practical level that within the post-carbon age- They're obviously of, not nihilistic. They're not nihilistic. And, and you know, there, there's a lot of smart people there that want to have a future. And they see that they're going to be, you know, um, flushed in the age where we've legalized carbon. Their entire economy is based on, on carbon production, carbon dioxide production, effectively. Um, but so they have, they want to join. Even they become, I think, observers at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. They they are now working in a much more constructive way. Although maybe with Yemen, that's still a questionable thing. That's that's difficult. But despite that, there's a huge revival now of high speed rail that's currently being funded in the, I think it's like $200 billion to build this cross Arabian um, rail line high speed. That's again, really a, in a very different philosophy. It could tie in very easily through Djibouti 
uh, via the uh, the El Mandib Straits in the Red Sea into a, what's already existing in Ethiopia and other countries for rail a rail renaissance and, and hydroelectric renaissance, which is also why Ethiopia is under attack by the U.S. State Department too, with their support of the the Tigray People's Liberation Party, uh, which is again just a proxy. I mean, it, it's a proxy war using terrorists like they've been using with ISIS to destabilize or Ukrainian Nazis or Taiwanese idiots. Um, and and do you think do you think then that the countries the BRICS countries and those who will be involved with the multipolar um, system will actually pull out then of organizations like the World Health Organization and the UN and NATO? Do you think that they would? Well, you say the if they part, withdrew their their membership, what what would happen? Right now, they don't have the the power to do it. There's still power that they don't want to do direct battle with, which is where I think you see an effort to try to have influence within these existent or organizational structures um, that benefits their paradigm and not the depopulation agenda. Um, so, like for example, um, in principle, would the United Nations be intrinsically bad? I would say based on my historical research of the fights that created the UN, no, no, because I see the UN originally under the Franklin Roosevelt orientation as having been created as its own charter admit attests to, to the sacred enshrinement of sovereign nation states as the principle of law. I know Dave, Ian Davis disagrees with my, my assessment, but I stand by it and I think I've demonstrated it fairly well. Uh, it's it's right there at the beginning of the UN Charter, as well as the non-intervention of one country into another's affairs. That's also enshrined. So the fact that it has not been abided by is is irrelevant to this question. Can it, is there anything viable within it that could offer the seeds of its own renewal or uh, reform? I think so. Yes, um, and I think certainly Putin, uh, Xi, Modi, many other leaders believe that that is still possible, but certain changes have to still, I think, make their way as the current collapse of the Western banking system is moving us into that. Um, we, ha we have to learn how to eat some humble pie and break break free of certain oligarchical shackles controlling many of the Western regimes. And we'll find that if that happens, a lot of the other countries in Africa who are being just sort of intimidated to go along with things would quickly, quickly uh, leap into a better way. They're just being intimidated and strong-armed. You know, As far as the World, World Health Organization, Ah, you know, I probably, I don't probably beyond redemption. Probably so. Um, is the idea and unfortunately of like we have an Irish law. connection as well? You know that. Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't know. You know, I, I don't I don't really have any political power, <laughs> so it's all like very kind of armchair philosophy for me right now. You know, is is it intrinsically but, impossible? But but if we if we build new systems in parallel, that we can show with these new systems actually that we do live in a creative universe that we are not bound by the constraints that we're being fed through propaganda and that we can convince people to look at the real world data that can prove that you know categorically um i almost feel like it's about making those organizations irrelevant yeah, you know, that's the best way to, to often defeat your enemy is just by being successful. You know, it's, it's demonstrate in a living way that what they say you can't do, you just did. So it's like, prove, prove me wrong. Like, like I just did it. <laughs> you said I couldn't do it. I did it. <laughs> Deal with that reality now, sucker. Um, yeah, like, I think that that's, that's a good, a good philosophy and a good orientation. I, I do think that we, we would need to beef up the intellectual, uh, and, and historical understanding the fortitude of the resistance to the Great Reset, especially around some of these more principled historical um, lessons and fights that we're currently living in. Because I think that when you look at what it was that made Donald Trump originally, despite his idiotic blind spots and other things that he's accommodated to way too much, um, despite that, he certainly put online a program and a method of getting there that was viable that was premised around utilizing the power of the sovereign nation state. He talked about bringing back Glass-Steagall to break up the Wall Street banks before they blow and let them take their own their own losses, let them take their own detonation. Don't put the detonation out of the people. That's vital. I don't see how you're going to get out of the current storm if you don't do that fast for Europe and Canada, too. Um, he talked about, you know, working with Russia on Arctic development, building rail through a Alberta, which would have been a really great springboard to salvage the Canadian economy, which has been hollowed out. 
and also get us into a cooperative relationship on Arctic development with Russia as our friend, rather than seeing it as a zone of conflict, building nu uh, nuclear weapons or silos, which we're currently moving towards right now in preparation for a war over the Arctic, instead of like, there's so many resources and abundance there, we could find way many, like so many places of agreement. Oh, it's um, unbelievable, isn't it? When you actually think about the, the just the sheer numbers involved in terms of how much has been spent yeah on on that you know as you said the silos and and arming so ourselves preparing ourselves for a war when actually if we just redirected those funds and the, that energy you know what we could achieve would just be pretty incredible well, and this is the quote that I, I wanted to show, and I think it's worth, based on what we're saying now, Trump, I think he gave nightmares to some of those who are controlling Russiagate uh, in April 5th, 2019, when all of a sudden he didn't even announce it, but the, he invited the vice premier of China to the Oval Office, didn't announce it, and gave a surprise speech where he basically said, between Russia, China, and us, we are all making hundreds of billions of dollars worth of weapons, including nuclear, which is ridiculous. I think it's much better if we all got together and didn't make these weapons. Those three countries, I think, can come together and stop the spending and spend on things that are more productive towards long term peace. Wow. And I mean, like um, Xi Jinping said, you know, when asked, like, well, what about the, the trade war and the antagonism between Trump and you? And, you know, Trump had just been invited and went to the Forbidden Palace with uh, with with she and his wife, you know, and it was a, like a, a meeting where they rolled out all the red carpets. And she said, you know, it's hard to imagine a complete break with the United States from China or from China and the United States. We are not interested in this. And our American partners at the time, Trump, are not interested in this. President Trump is my friend, and I am convinced he is also not interested in this. Um, the, the, what was signed coming out of this was the first of many planned U.S.-China trade deals where China was going to help the rebuilding and retooling of American industry that had been destroyed for 50 years with the US-China trade deal. China was gonna buy $350 billion beginning in January of 2020 of US finished goods from Philadelphia, Detroit that have become just like, I mean, these are like dark age zones of, of gang warfare now, but they were gonna be revived once again, like they were. And China's growth model was vital to absorb that production and provide the revenue needed to help America once again, get back on its own two feet as well. That was all derailed by, you know, and this is again, this damn thing, this thing that was announced, right, that caused the world to shut down in January 2020, well, then later March. And Soros in January 2020 literally says at the Davos summit that Trump and Xi Jinping are the greatest threats to the new world order and open society. And he calls later on for Xi Jinping to be overthrown by a coup, which puts George Soros in alignment completely with a lot of his right-wing anti-great reset conspiracy minded um enemies they're all of a sudden all championing the exact same thing and he also calls for trump to be taken down in the you know what became the well, i was very shocked to hear uh trump's speech um what was it at davos was it at davos when he said davos, the world he... does not belong to the globalists yeah and that was a very different uh trump than we had obviously been allowed to see in in uh in our media you know, oh, yeah. in fact, was... I'm even convinced now that they just always had a filter on him that made him look, you know, really orange. <laughs> just oh, convinced, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. So. Yeah, and he, and he directly took aim at Malthus, Thomas Malthus by name at that, at that Davos speech. And he showcased the Brunelleschi Dome and the great discoveries of the great Renaissance that proved that there is no limit on human population potential. That was a great speech, his best, I think. Yeah. Um, but that I, was was very, I was pretty, pretty surprised to see it. Matthew, yeah. I'm just, I suddenly just realized the time. We have been okay. talking for two hours yeah um it has been it has flown by i it's unbelievable um we've i think we've been you know all over the universe and back again uh you know in this conversation but i suppose to to finish you know what would you what would you say to the people in Ireland in terms of when we look at the great famine we look at what's now being forced down our throats with the great reset you know what would your advice be to ordinary people on the street what what can we do Okay, well, I mean, look, it, the key thing right now is to have a very strong sense of historic, of, of, of principles shaping history, which are shaping our future. Our future is underdetermined, and it is only going to be determined by the ideas we choose or choose to not to, to ignore. Uh, but the, the ideas that are true that we can discover, that we absorb into our identities, will determine whether or not 
our children will have a world worth living in. Currently speaking, we are in a state of obvious crisis. The banking system, it will collapse. So obviously, yes, we have to be thinking about protecting our family and our network and our, our community. But at the same time, as we do those things, and don't get me wrong, I am doing those things too. I'm not just simply thinking about, I'm not saying just think abstractly about just the Just admit big- it, you have a bunker full of tin goods somewhere. <laughs> I, I, got some, I got some not perishables, let's just say. <laughs> but all that to say at the same measure too, the, the thing that your, your enemies, and we do have enemies, the thing that, that makes them afraid the most is the institution of the sovereign nation state system itself that gives us all, since we are all the government, we are the government, there's not the government and then there's us. It's the same, it's the same thing. We are the government. It gives us, when we're organized in a, in a form of wisdom, animated by strategic reality, a power to do things that individually we could not do either as units or as even little micro communities. We can do much greater good, but it requires a greater degree of wisdom and, and organizational power that we have to be able to also do. The, the last years of QAnon and other things have unfortunately caused a lot of people to waste a lot of time sitting back and enjoying the show, eating the popcorn, whatever, trusting in the plan and not preparing themselves. We have wasted a lot of time not developing our own internal capacities. So that's what we have to make up for now quickly. Russia and China want to work with other countries. They want to have um, cooperation easily. Russia can provide, and Putin has said so, abundance of energy to Europe. All he said is, we have to just turn on the tap. Everything is, is ready to go. The will is there. The means are there. Everything is there on their side. They're even willing to bring the, the, the excess oil through the, the, the Turk stream, you know, through Turkey. They could just add a few little distribution uh, centers very quickly and it, it's ready to go. So there's no need to starve or freeze or anything. No need to adapt to abundance. We just have to simply accept that we want a future and act accordingly in terms of organizing to ensure that um, viable candidates, like in the case of the United States, are brought quickly into power. We have an election happening very soon. I don't know how much fraud can possibly occur within that time. Sorry, my guts. Yeah, you've gone all blurry. Yeah, I got blurry. I thought, it was, my, I thought it was like, hang on, I, where am I? Man, no, I no, see you better without my glasses now. There you go. Yeah, I, got a, I, got a thing, I got a solution. Yeah. I just got to do that, and then I do that, and then it's better. Yay, there you go. Yeah, okay. So I think we do need to run as candidates, run and organize town halls and organize and make sure that the policies of the newly elected officials, like those Republicans who will be brought online in the United States very soon, um, provided there's not like, I guess, nuclear war, but barring that, I don't see how the Democrats could not get their asses kicked. Um, We have to make sure that they're animated by the proper sense of policy and strategy that Trump had exhibited at his best before this whole pandemic thing swept the world into a, a, a crazy land. Um, same thing for the case of you know Ireland and Europe. I mean, we need to really organize and look at how are we going to be able to demand that a policy change happens in such a way that certain principles of national law ensure that the, the too big to fail bankers take their losses, and we have viable structures in place to um, that can float, that can work with the Eurasian Alliance and increasingly become more over time um, normative in our in our Western stupid dumbed down society. Because well, people are gonna wanna float, you know, like at the end of the day, a lot of people are still um, asleep. They don't believe that they're underwater yet, though they're suffocating, but they a lot of people still believe that they're not suffocating. They will feel it very soon. And with that, with that will become a desire to have oxygen and we have to be prepared to pull them up out of the water. So provide the means to get that oxygen to people and get them out of the water. Um, they're going to want it, though they don't well, want it. Yet. On that note, Matthew, um, Making Sense would like to formally invite you and your wife, Cynthia, to come and be a keynote speaker at our conference uh, in, uh, in December in Dublin. Uh, well, it may not be Dublin uh, because, uh, you know, Dublin Centre... Dublin centers are, are uh, kind of pretty crazy and we, we don't want to give in to the whole <laughs> that side of things. But uh, if you and Cynthia would love to, would like to come over, we'd love to have you here. So you can help us understand, you know, how do we pull ourselves up? How do we have an adult conversation, understand our history, understand, you know, to learn from those mistakes in the past and, uh, and really kind of move forward to much brighter future. So if you're willing, 
uh, you know, we'd love to have you here. Yeah, of course I'm willing. I'd love to be there. Okay, yeah, we're there. Cynthia, I'm sure, is going to uh, be smiling um, a lot. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> thank you so much. So this, yeah. is, this is a conference on communities and actually, you know, creating how communities can basically build themselves up, how they can look at things like food, fuel, uh, you know, the environment, the financial side of things, and how do we, you know, essentially re regain our sovereign when we are sovereign, but how do we really reclaim Okay, that sounds good. Those are conversations that need to happen. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Matthew, thank you for your time. I cannot believe it's been over two hours. I think this might have to go out in two parts. Um, no but it's been such fun. And I always just learn so much listening to you. Um, you know, it's just an absolute honor and a privilege to talk to you. Oh, it's uh, the pleasure's all mine. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you. Uh, say, say hi to Ronan for me. I will do. We're going to let you go. Thank you so much. And we Bye. will we will see you really soon. I hope so. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Bye. <laughs>